drive the internet into a 10x growth. I'd like to start out by introducing our keynote, uh, keynote speaker. And uh, is, John, is John Kenny around here? OK, good. Great. Fantastic. So as, a, uh, as an owner of a Toyota Highlander hybrid car, it gives me a uh, special great honor to introduce Dr. John Kenny. Uh, John is a principal researcher at the Toyota Info Technology Center in Mountain View. And he is uh, representing Toyota in cooperative projects between the Vehicle Safety Communications Consortium and the US Department of Transportation. It's uh, very interesting that he will be talking about uh, DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communications, which is uh, an exciting way where uh, we can look at writing DSRC applications to communicate with new cars. So, you know, the Internet of Things is entering into homes and buildings and also cars. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. John Kenny. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we wait for this to turn on, let me just say how uh, happy I am to be here with you tonight. Um, I was very pleased uh, on entering to run into my old friend and colleague Vishal Sharma. Uh, so it's, it's great to see uh, a friendly face. Um, but I'm really pleased to be invited to come address this group tonight. This one's on. Do we worry about that one or shall I go ahead? Okay. Um, so my talk tonight is VDEX communication and in the spirit of this group, I called it an invitation to innovation. So let's start with uh, a somewhat obscure question. Uh, 33,561. Anybody wanna take a gander as to the significance of that number? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, 33 million cars? My license plate number? <laughs> what if I add this, 2012? Any number of car Tesla sold? Car accidents, getting close? Right. If we, if we Google that, we'll see that it's the number of people who died in car crashes in 2012 in America. It's kind of a sobering number. It's a lot of people. 33,561 fatalities. So in the car industry, um, we look at numbers like that and it prompts us to say, what if, what if we could somehow use technology to make driving safer? And in my line of work, it's the specific question, what if we can use wireless communication to make driving safer? And the good news is, yes, we can. And the answer to that, at least the, t the part of it that I'm going to talk about tonight, is this new technology called Dedicated Short Range Communication, or DSRC. Just as one, uh, one fact point uh, for DSRC is that the U.S. Department of Transportation, through their analyses, has estimated that this technology, if, if equipped in all cars, could address 80% of traffic scenarios involving unimpaired drivers, 80%. So it's huge, huge ups upside potential uh, for this technology to make driving safer. So I only have 15 minutes. I can talk about this for a long time. I'm gonna try to keep this short um, and, and just whet your interest a little bit about DSRC. So what is it? What is DSRC? Well, at its heart, it's an ad hoc networking technology that connects vehicles to other things. So we often use the shorthand V to X, where uh, X could be another vehicle, V to V, or roadside infrastructure, V to I, or pedestrians, or bicycles, or just about anything. So V to from anything uh, can be done over DSRC. Um, 
And, and the, the D in DSRC stands for dedicated, meaning we have spectrum allocated for this purpose. And the SR, the short range, in this context means on the order of hundreds of meters. So it's not cellular type of reach. It's also not, uh, it's not very, tremendously short range, it's hundreds of meters. This is part of a bigger thing called the Intelligent Transportation System, and it is a key part of the USDOT Connected Vehicle Program. What's it good for? Well, as I already implied, it's good for saving lives. And it does that by allowing collisions to be prevented in the first place. And preventing collisions also reduces injuries, saves property damage. But DSRC can be used for a lot of other things as well. It can provide information to drivers that makes their driving experience more efficient, saving time, saving fuel, saving the environment. But it can also be used for other things like commercial services and electronic commerce, or the sky's the limit. So it creates, as I call it here, a sandbox for innovation. And that's what I'm hoping to get you excited about here tonight. Uh, we have some ideas what it's gonna be used for, but uh, hopefully you'll have other ideas we haven't even thought of yet. Let me explain this core V2V safety use case a little bit more so it's a little more clear. The idea is that every vehicle will send out a message called a basic safety message several times per second and it'll send it out over several hundred meters in a 360 degree broadcast for anyone who can hear it to use in the best way that they can. And this basic safety message is gonna tell the other listeners, mostly other vehicles, where this vehicle sender is uh, and other core state information. How fast it's going, what its heading is, if it's accelerating, what its brake status is, how big it is, uh, lots of information. And you, there's some, some details in the, in the yellow box in the lower left corner. The only thing I want to point out about this, this picture, this nice picture I got from the USDOT, is that the little white circles around the vehicle are, could be a little misleading. We're not talking about uh, communication that only goes to the next vehicle. As I've, as I've said, it's several hundred meters worth of communication. So that gets you, um, that gets you to uh, many vehicles behind you or around corners, uh, places that maybe your other sensors can't see, can't tell you about. This is, these are just a few of the, of the core um, collision scenarios that DSRC in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication with this basic safety message can help prevent. And, and I won't go through them in detail, but the, the, the idea here is that it's pretty much all types of collisions, whether it's front to rear, front to side, front to front. Uh, because we're doing 360 degree communication, uh, all of these things can be prevented. When you receive a basic safety message from another car, you can, you can predict what its trajectory is going to be and you know information about your own trajectory and you can look for potential collision threats. Uh, if, you, if your onboard computer then uh, recognizes a, a potential collision threat, it can provide a warning to the driver through uh, audible or video or, or haptic types of feedback or it can even take control of the car by braking or steering in more advanced systems. So this is the core use case of V2V safety from DSRC. But there are lots of other things that DSRC can be used for. Here's a list of applications that the USDOT has as part of its connected vehicle research program. And these, many of these are, are enabled through infrastructure to vehicle communication. So uh, the V2V safety ones take up a relatively small part over here on the left. And this is not all either. These are just the ones that are actively being researched by USDOT. Again, opportunities for innovation for creative people who can figure out uh, ways to use this communication platform uh, that we're going to be putting in cars. For those of you who like to know a little bit more about how the technology works and like to think in terms of protocol stacks, um, this, is, this is a diagram that explains the, the basic uh, standards that, upon which DSRC is, is based. Um, I won't go through this in any detail, but uh, a, couple of, a couple of points to make. One, at the physical and MAC layer, this is based on 802.11 technology. It's through an amendment called 802.11p, or the Wireless Access and Vehicular Environments uh, Amendment. Um, so that helps us uh, leverage the economies of scale of Wi-Fi and there have already been announcements about uh, Wi-Fi companies that Wi-Fi silicon vendors who plan to put this, support this uh, amendment in their standard offerings, including in smartphones. 
Most of the rest of the protocols here are more purpose-built for the DSRC environment, uh, either through the IEEE 1609 working group or through SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers. But you can also run internet protocols over DSRC when that's appropriate. Uh, we try to avoid the overhead of, of IP when we aren't doing routing, um, but it's available if you, want to, if, you, if you have applications that can make use of that. The standards are, are relatively mature. We're still making uh, improvements to them, but, um, but they're relatively, relatively mature and interoperability tests have been shown uh, to, with lots of suppliers to show that, this can, that, that the standards are, uh, are effective in, in allowing equipment to interoperate. Uh, another simple diagram here just to kind of drive home the point, what are the constituent elements of the DSRC system? It, well, at least in, in, at least in support of the V2V safety system, what do we need? We need a GPS system so we know where we are with, with fairly high precision, uh, like lane level precision. Um, we have other internal sensors that tell us other things about the state of the car that we want to communicate to our neighbors. Uh, we have the, the processing that allows us to both um, uh, create the messages and also process the incoming messages. Um, we have the radio, of course, to, to communicate over the air, and then we have the driver interface to be able to communicate to our driver when there's something urgent going on. Um, I've just taken a, a photo here in our garage of our test vehicle. With the, We happen to have four DSRC antennas on the top of the Prius at that moment because we were doing a, uh, testing with multiple systems at the same time. So there are little, little uh, mag mount antennas that we're using in production. It might look uh, different or probably look nicer. Uh, the people who care about that will do a good job of making your your toy to look good. Um, I'm showing here in the lower right a Denso system. Um, Denso is one of the companies that we've worked closely with, but there are many suppliers who provided DSRC prototypes in testing environments. So um, these are small devices. They're not overly complicated. They're not going to be overly expensive on the order of probably the entire system with, with cabling and antenna is going to be on, on the order of a couple hundred dollars or less. I'll mention the spectrum again because the D stands for dedicated. Um, we have 75 megahertz of spectrum that was allocated by the FCC way back in 1999 for this. And um, we've channelized it into seven 10 megahertz channels. Uh, one of those channels, the one shown here in the red on the, on the left, is, um, is specially designated to carry these basic safety messages. The yellow one in the middle of the control channel is a place where uh, devices that want to advertise the offering of DSRC services of one type or another can send a special advertisement message. Cars that are driving by will tune to that channel to listen for advertisements, listen for services that they may want to take advantage of, and then that advertisement will tell in turn what other channel to tune to to take advantage of the service. So this is an effective way of having this multi-channel operation without needing seven radios for seven channels. So that's the kind of the basic idea of how the spectrum will be used. So from a technical point of view as an engineer, you know, we like to ask what's hard about this. And the first thing I realized as I got involved in this is that it's not all technical. Uh, the hard parts are not all technical. They involve policy, they involve business cases, they involve governance issues, um, and they're all intertwined with each other. Um, so uh, we could talk about that a lot tonight, but uh, I'll, I'll just say that as a high level kind of a paradigm for thinking about it. Um, the, the things that we tend to spend, we, we have spent and are spending most of our time on uh, to develop this in the research phase are uh, mobility. We have to make this networking work with uh, vehicles that are moving very quickly by each other. Uh, so that was the main focus of the 802.11p amendment. Positioning has to be accurate enough to uh, prevent collisions. That's not, that's not easy, but we've demonstrated that it can work. Scalability, we need to make this work in environments where there are hundreds or even a few thousand vehicles in close proximity to each other. We need to make sure it doesn't fall down in that, uh, in that highly dense environment. Security and privacy are key issues. We need to, when you receive a basic safety message or some other message, you have to have some reason to trust it. So we have to build some security mechanisms in so that you know that you're getting messages from authorized senders. But at the same time, we don't want to compromise the, the privacy of our customers by the fact that their vehicle is sending out this message several times per second. So we have to disassociate the content of the message from the car itself and, of the, and the owner of the car so you can't link the two easily together. This is, this is something that we spent a lot of time working on. 
And, the, and a final issue that I'll mention, a final challenge that I'll mention uh, that's come up in the last year or so is spectrum sharing. So we have this dedicated spectrum we're uh, allocated for. We're, we're a primary user in that spectrum. But some of you may know that the FCC last year uh, put a question on the table of whether or not unlicensed devices should be able to share this spectrum with DSRC on a non-interference basis. Uh, in other words, if an unlicensed device like a Wi-Fi device can use the spectrum without causing any harmful interference to DSRC, the FCC is interested to know whether that can work. So there's a lot of work going on right now, a lot of dialogue between the DSRC community and the Wi-Fi community to talk about uh, how that might work and whether it can work. And this is, this is a big challenge for us right now. We've completed um, a, a very large scale trial in Ann Arbor in, uh, about a year ago, uh, where nearly 3,000 vehicles were equipped with DSRC and the drivers drove in their normal driving patterns for a year. USDOT collected uh, mountains of data and, and have begun analyzing it and, uh, and, and, and assessing the benefits associated with this technology for, for collision avoidance. So where is this going? Well, in February of this year, partly based on that data, uh, NHTSA, which regulates cars, made an important announcement that they plan to require this DSRC technology in new cars within a few years, and they've begun a rulemaking process to do that. They advanced that in, uh, in August with, with the release of a 300-page research readiness report. Um, they're building test beds across the country, and they're also encouraging uh, people to uh, participate in what they're calling pilot deployments, early stage deployments where some of these applications can be tested out. So there's a lot of momentum. Uh, we're, I think, through the, the main research phase and we're in, in the early stages of deployment at this point, it will still take a few years. The automotive industry doesn't move very fast, especially when safety is concerned. These things have to be rigorously um, borne out. So I'll end with just um, uh, a little bit of a playful thing just uh, to ask. Uh, probably nobody can guess what this is, but um, uh, it's a diagram. Let, let, me, let me remove the black ovals and see if, if anybody then can guess what it is. Somebody? Yep. I heard, I heard we have a winner in the back. Somebody said ARPANET. This is, this is Larry Roberts' hand-drawn diagram of of at least the West Coast phase of the ARPANET circa 1969. And, and why am I showing this to you? Because I think it's important to remember that great things don't always uh, end up looking like they started out. Um, and sim what, what can start out as a simple idea can grow into something uh, tremendous. And I feel that DSRC has the has a potential to be a, of that type of technology. It's not going to be an internet but when you think about the potential of connecting cars with a communication platform that allows them to communicate with their, with their, uh, with their environment, uh, and, if you, and if you allow yourself to be creative, which I know you are, um, tremendous things can come of that. So we're motivated to do this by um, collision avoidance and safety, but I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so I wanted to leave you with that thought. Uh, and encourage you to be uh, innovators and, and entrepreneurs and, and make, this, uh, make this technology really exciting. And with that, I'll come to an end. Thank you very much. Um, before I invite um, our next speaker, Gene and his colleague Song here, I would like to first take a moment to thank Vanessa Jucker. She's standing right there. Uh, she is one. Yes, thank you, thank you. I was going to ask you to give a big round of applause for putting together this awesome program with MP and team. MP Divakar, obviously, you've seen him earlier, but I wanted to make sure she was well recognized because she's the one who did this uh, whole thing from Thai side. So we appreciate it very much, Vanessa. So let's give her a big round of applause now. All right, good. Thank you. So before, I, so I'd like to introduce Gene Wong, our next speaker. Gene is founder and CEO of People Power. The reason I wanted to do that. I've had the privilege of working with him for two years here at Thai, actually getting his free volunteer services, just like all of us. Um, so that's why I felt that I have to come and recognize that as well. Uh, Gene is a uh, serial entrepreneur, five time, four time CEO. Is that correct? So now I remember, I just, I've done that a few times. So and, um, so, and obviously you heard him before introducing our last speaker. He's really highly experienced 
uh, as an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur. Last company was sold to HP, and right now uh, he is at People Power, taking it to the next heights. So with that, I would like to invite him as well as uh, Song, his colleague here. And thank you, thank you, Nadine. thank you again. All right, let's give them a big round of applause. Fantastic, please. thank you. Fantastic. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, the Internet of Things and consumer apps for billions of uh, Internet of Things devices. And uh, you heard a little bit about my background. I, I do startups because I love them. And I hope how many of you out there are working on a startup? Raise your hand. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's what it's all about. And for all of you who are working on a startup or who are thinking about a startup, go for it. There's nothing like it. Super exciting. And IoT is really just a tremendous opportunity for everyone. I'd like to invite Song up uh, with me. He's uh, People Power's Vice President of Product Management. He's got a lot of experience doing a bunch of startups too. He's going to give a, a, a little bit of a demonstration of what we're doing at People Power. Um, but you know, first I want to say that the, the uh, smart home market in the Internet of Things is really projected to grow to a $52 billion market by 2020 with a compound annual growth rate of almost 18%. Uh, another report calls it 71 billion by 2018, even more aggressive, rising from 33 billion last year. So there is a lot of room for a lot of big companies and startups to really make a great living in this IoT space. Looking at AT&T and their offering, um, if you're familiar with uh, some of the as advertising that AT&T is doing on the Digital Life Smart Security um, offering. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking about uh, $40 a month as opposed to ADT Pulse's $50 a month, uh, $250 worth of equipment, and then, you know, they, they give you some eight window door sensors, motion detector, smoke detector, and then they upsell you on a whole wide variety of systems like video cameras, door packages, energy packages, water leak detectors, water control, and so on. And let me tell you that this is both validating the market, but it's also creating this huge soft underbelly because that is a ton of money. And they, they are cheaper than ADT. And I am very sure that amongst this crowd, there are a lot of people who can out-innovate, out-think, and create a gigantic opportunity for these kinds of services and create these great applications. Now, we actually, uh, at, at, at People Power, we actually have an application called Presence, which um, we're, I'm very happy to say that uh, on Sunday, we were... Uh, deemed to be the number one genius thing to do with your old smartphone. And as a result, we shot up in the App Store rankings. We've actually been in the top 100 apps out of 1.7 million apps on the App Store. We've been in the top 100 in 26 countries now. Um, I think we, in this latest uh, USA Today thing, and by the way, Vanessa, if I click this, will the sound play? No? Okay. I won't play it. But, you know, we were, in, we were in Good Morning America. We were in USA Today. And it's really an app that turns your old smartphone into a free Wi-Fi video camera with built-in motion detection and video alerts. And I, and I liked uh, on the other panel, they were talking about the freemium model. That's exactly what we do. It's a freemium model where you can start for absolutely free. You take your old smartphone, and uh, the, the USA Today lady basically gets on the video and says, have you seen the iPhone 6? Wow, you know, and what are you going to do with your old phone? And basically what, what we do is we enable you to reuse all of those sensors in all of those old phones for free, 
But then we upsell you with more and more features. And then the question is, OK, well, what would some of these things be? And um, you know, what we're, what the, I, I agree with the one gentleman sitting at the end, which is, you know, you don't want to just do technology for technology's sake. It's got to be something that people really care about. And you know, if it's just counting steps, who cares? I, I've lived for many years without knowing exactly how many steps I've taken, right? But what do people care about? They care about their family. They care about their pets. They care about their elders. They care about their safety. They care about their security. And so those are the types of things that we try to address. And let me tell you, people power alone is not going to address nearly, you know, we'll just do the tip of the iceberg. There is plenty of opportunity for people to target great consumer apps that take advantage of Internet of Things devices and make them really meaningful, you know, helping the safety and security and comfort and convenience for your home and for your family. Uh, we just did a... We just did a 500 user survey of our presence users, and this is just uh, just a, as of a couple of weeks ago. And you know, one of the things is you you have to make something that's useful. And we're very lucky that 93% of the presence users find presence, you know, useful. But and 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 what do they use them for? It's really our users use it principally for security. 25% for uh, watching pets. In fact, I, you know, I, I, every day I watch my, my dog jump up on the couch and bark at people. So <laughs> it's, uh, and actually it was really funny. The, uh, there was this uh, presence user who, I, you know, we get emails all the time. They have two dogs and they finally figured out which of the dogs is peeing in the house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of those questions that really bother you all the time. But this is, I thought I'd share this because this has some utility for the audience who is maybe looking at what kind of devices, Internet of Things devices, are people looking for. And in our user base, at least, the most desirable device additions to presence are window door sensor, followed by, with, with over, you know, about 53%. Followed by smoke alarm, infrared motion detector, broken window sensor. And then way down here is connected thermostat. And notice that Nest sold for $3.2 billion to Google. And they were number eight. <laughs> All right, who's going to do better than that $3.2 billion? That's my question to you. Think about that one. That, that, uh, that should be an interesting thing to consider. Here are some just other random answers from our customer base. Link with vehicle. So I think John will be happy to hear that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. And by the way, you know, I, I, uh, in addition to my wife's Toyota Highlander, I just got a very cool Audi S5 Cabriolet, and it has these sensors where, where what happens is somebody pulls up to my side in my blind spot and this little light goes on in the mirror. It's so cool. I mean, just these kind of little safety features I think are enormous because I certainly don't want to be one of those 33,000 people who go and kill themselves. And by the way, all of you are in much more danger now because my daughter just started driving. <laughs> so watch yourself. Another one, alert me if my 84-year-old father-in-law falls in his house. And I, and I heard another speaker talking about exactly that. And by the way, um, I personally have visited this, this company that one of the speakers talked about, Chihu 360, and they actually have 900 million users. They're going big time into Internet of Things, and a lot of the things that we're going to be consuming here are coming from China. So there, there is, I mean, the, there is going to be a lot of momentum moving in this direction. And I think these are, these are some of the kinds of devices and services that people are looking for. Now, 
Actually, we don't consider ourselves an app company or just a pure app company, even though we're mostly known for our successful app. We're really working to build the IOE or Internet of Everything platform. This is the technology behind the app. And you can see we have a mobile stack and then a server stack. And what we are, what we are making available is this open platform for people to just build on top of, starting for free. All of the APIs are available on the website and then leverage into our, you know, rough, you know, we, we have a, we have quite a, quite a, quite a few users. We support all kinds of different protocols because in my opinion, the internet of things is not going to converge in our lifetimes to one protocol. It's going to be, you know, a whole hodgepodge, unfortunately. You know, it's not, I'm, I'm not for this, but this is, I think, the reality. You know, but Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Z-Wave, Zigbee of all flavors, and then proprietary protocols of various kinds. And it's all going to have to be super simple for the end user. So one of the things that entrepreneurs need to be thinking about is in addition to use cases, it's taking the messy spaghetti code of network protocols and different architectures and converging that into a very, very simple to set up and simple to use and simple to service system. Otherwise, consumers will be slow to adopt. So that's, uh, that's my quick talk. I'm going to now let Song set up... Uh, set up on, uh, but you know, it's a very exciting time because I think the internet has all been about 5 billion people browsing from their computers various websites and that, those days are over. You know, that's in the rear view mirror now. What we're talking about is 50 billion or more connected devices of all shapes and sizes. And Song, take it away. Okay, very roll. All right, I talk real loud, so I may not, may not need this. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna talk about something totally different now. So what can you do with that cool Internet of Things platform that Gene just showed you? Well, did you guys know last week that one of the biggest demonstrations of global warming and marches happened uh, in New York and other places around the world? Everybody know that, right? So a lot of people these days care about global warming. And one of the things that causes global warming is energy usage, lots and lots of energy usage. So I know everybody here wants to not add to global warming. They want to save energy, make things better, but how do you do it? I mean, does anybody here actually know how much energy you use on a, on a monthly basis, let's say? Anybody? Oh, he does. <laughs> there's, one, there's one. That's good. Most people get a bill for PG&E once a month, and they go, oh, cool, more than last month, less than last month. Okay, that's it. That's all you know. So how are you supposed to change your usage and your habits if you don't understand what you're using? Well, the one way you can do that is getting real-time data. So we did. We said, let's take the Internet of Things platform, hook it to your energy use, and let people see the real-time use on smartphones, on, on browsers, and things like that. And not only let's do that, but let's make, the, make it social. Make, them, make their friends do it. Make everybody do it. Kind of start a movement. And let's make it easy to deploy so that energy efficiency companies and utilities can do it on a mass scale. So what I'm going to show you today is the mobile app, which allows you to see it individually, and also the management console that allows uh, energy efficiency companies and utilities to manage the entire program. So real quickly, I'm going to show you on this iPad here. I'll do all one-fingered. <laughs> so uh, it's called Presence. Um, this is the application that Dean talked about. Now this took to my house. You can see on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of devices. One of them is a power cost meter. So with hardware partners, such as Blue Line, TED, and others, we've actually enabled our Internet of Things platform hooked to their hardware readers. So if I click on this hardware power cost meter here, I can see over here uh, what I'm using right now, as well as any historical information. If I click now, I can see that, hey, guess what? My house is using right now 927 watts. I mean, somebody's at home using the power, <laughs> okay? And uh, that will cost me, if they keep this up, $134 this month, right? I can see it in real time. This refreshes every five seconds, so I can see what's going on when I flip on something and see what happens. But what if I want to see the view over time, okay? Let me go back here, and you'll see that there's a historical graph. Hit historical here, it'll tell me, for instance, what's going on today, so you can see what's going on today, but you now what if I want to see the month view and see what's going on for the month? I can see what's going on for the entire month. Wow, there's a huge peak there. What, what was that? Well, I can just grab that, drag it, and say, what's going on there? Well, I can see it's 4, 
Uh, 4,000 kilowatts, I can tell you the people at my house, we had guests for the house guests, they don't worry about energy, they flip everything on. <laughs> and so in, anyway, so what's so nice is I can get this in real time now and really understand what I'm using at any given point in time. Now, how do I tell people about that and make them excited about this as well? Well, you see this little button that says share? I can hit the little share button, and now I can actually send it to my social media network, send it to other people who are in the program, and let them know what I'm doing, give them hints and tips, let them share hints and tips with me, things like that. So we make it very, very easy to actually get that information now. But also notice on this side, there's not just my power cost meter, there's also things like my laser printer, my phones, things like that. I have everything in my house connected together. So if I want to, I can remotely turn on things, turn off things, make sure they're not e eating energy when I don't know about it. And just like my power cost meter, I can track individual appliances. Oop, hit the wrong one. <laughs> okay, hit that one. Over here, I can see, for instance, my color laser is off now, so it's not really using any, any, any uh, power. But I can switch it on remotely if I want to, and then quickly get a read and see what kind of energy it's using up, right? So I'll tell you in a second here, let me go back here. And once it turns on, it'll, it'll, give me, it'll give me a reading. There's 743 watts. See, a laser printer eats a lot of power. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but it really does. And so now it's going to 12 because it went to standby mode now, right, afterwards, right? And what's really cool is I can actually uh, manipulate and understand everything that's going on. So how do I make that even interconnect now? I've got my meter. I've got my devices. What's really cool about the present application is we can set some rules very, very quickly and say, you know what? I want to say, when I'm home or when I'm away, turn things off. When I come home, turn them on. If I see motion, turn things off. I can control all that stuff. And it's super easy to do rules. We just use a very simple if then, if then, if this then that interface. So that's what this is here. You just program it here right on the screen. So really cool app to make it very simple to tie all your stuff together. But now, what about the admin side? So let's say I want to do this on mass scale. I want tens of thousands, 100,000 people to do this. We've got the Presence Command Center. This actually is a program that actually manage and monitor all the devices out in multiple homes. So if, for instance, in this program, we actually have launched this um, in places that use a lot of energy, like Hawaii and the Cape, things like that, Cape Cod. This one actually is the Cape Cod one. So this will show me, for instance, all the people that are in the program. If I'm interested in what a particular person is doing, I click on this information here. And what's really cool about this is we connect not only to their meter, but also to their energy uh, provider. So you can see here, you can see here, this little guy will not only show me what they're using right now, this, there you go, but also all the historical data that's happened over the past three years. So I can see that this person's actually beginning to save energy when he understands what he's starting to use. I got to quantify that and make it real now, right? Now, one of the, one of the trickiest things about these programs is, okay, how do you know people's stuff is actually accurate and doing the right thing? <laughs> how do you know if they're still online, those kind of things? Well, we actually give you a, a whole console for that as well. So, uh, I'm going to my dashboard here. So my dashboard, I can see at a glance anytime which devices are online, which ones are offline. I can have it automatically flag me to call them down for support if something went, if something went wrong. If I want to, I can filter and say, okay, how many people are not connected in this particular case? I can say, uh, that's connected, folks. Let me go to, oops, let me go to disconnected. Come on, there you go. See, so hopefully it's not too many. <laughs> so anyway, so right now there's like, oh, about a dozen. That's not too bad. So basically, what's really nice is this lets me monitor and manage this entire program remotely. And what I can do is I can encourage people to do stuff that makes it even more compelling. And that's what the other part of the command center are about. You can see we have groups, we have messages, we have challenges, we have points. The idea is you can make people do things and get points for them, right? And, and people like to do that. They get prizes for doing this. And because of that, they actually get engaged more and more. In fact, we did a couple of studies with Stanford Change Labs. We figured out the best practices for behavioral kind of analysis, and we put it in this program so you can do it without even thinking about it, right? And so the idea here at People Power is we want to make sure that Internet of Things is useful. So I wanted to show you a really quick glimpse of how you can use it to do something you don't even think about much, which is energy and energy savings, and of course, make the earth a little bit greener. Now, this platform, by the way, um, about a week and a half ago, was awarded the CTIA 2014 award for the Green Telecom Networks uh, Award for Emerging Technology. So we know it's been, it's out there, and people acknowledge what it's doing. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Can you flip to the next? Um, and you know what? I forgot. Can, Charlotte, can you hold up that little robot there? So I am actually, I have, I have this robot that I'm going to control from my hand. So you, can you see I'm actually rotating the robot with my hand? So that, that's, that's an Internet of Things device that Presence is, is actually controlling. I can actually, I use this to look inside my home, look around, see when I'm, when I'm out. And that, that, that's, a, that's a very creative Internet of Things robot that, that uh, is available on the Presence store for 99 bucks. It's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, I would like to now introduce our next speaker, Jake Chuang.
and Jake is the Chief Product Officer of NeuroSky. Can you switch this? So uh, as the Chief Product Officer, Jake leads the science, engineering, and application solution for the company. And basically, they are doing body and mind monitoring analysis. And uh, they have some very innovative technologies for wearable health and wellness. Uh, please give a big round of applause to Jake. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, good evening. And uh, my originally, actually, my presentation was kind of prepared for like more like a half an hour talk. So I'm going to probably zip through a lot of things here. Um, so to begin with, uh, NeuroSky is a company that makes a biosensor. Oh, no problem. <clears throat> so biosensor, by the nature of it, is uh, most effective when it's uh, close to your body. So over the last eight years, we were designed into many things. But it, it was kind of until the last two years, we realized we are actually getting designed into wearable because uh, there was not, no such a thing as a wearable being touted before. And people were congratulating me, saying, wow, you guys are at the right place at the right time. The market is going to be huge for you. You know, you should wait for the wave. And yes, so, so I should be kind of um, getting my surfboard out and waiting for the wave to happen. So I waited, and unfortunately, it feels more like a swell, right? And it's even worse uh, earlier this year when the, the top or the first guy who's out to the market with uh, activity tracker, Nike, say they will stop uh, doing power. And one of the things is uh, basically, you know, there's speculation on why they do it. They never really come out and say why, but a lot of people assume it's because they're close tied with Apple, and they assume all those wearable stuff is going to be sucked into a uh, smartphone, just like a digital camera sort of disappear, you know, uh, once we have our, our cell phones, right? And I guess there, there was a, a, a kind of bridge of a new life uh, to the wearable side earlier this year when uh, Google announced uh, Google uh, Android Wear. And... Uh, about at the same time, too, I attended quite a few of those uh, IoT and wearable kind of conferences, and all the uh, the people, the pundits, start telling us uh, context awareness is kind of the best friend for wearable. It's the thing that really finally going to bring uh, wearable into this uh, huge wave that we're expecting. And if you are looking at uh, like Android Wear's uh, video, uh, it was talking about things like uh, when you go to a different city, different country, your, your watch now suddenly knows where you are, telling you the weather, things like that. That sounds great. Yeah, that, that's context awareness, right? But I turn around and think, you know, when I upgraded my iPhone from iPhone 6, uh, 6 iOS 6.0 to 7, it started telling me how long does it take for me to drive to work. I never tell my iPhone where it's work and it somehow figure out where work is for me, right? So definitely phone, smartphone itself is capable of doing all those uh, context awareness based on things like, you know, what, so what's context awareness uh, give us today? It's based on location awareness I talk about, you know, are you in, in the country, out of the country? What's your shopping habit? What's your, your uh, schedule? For example, do you have a, a son's birthday today, you're next to a toy store, then advertise uh, the toy sells to you. Your preferences, uh, you like basketball, you, you know, your favorite team is, uh, is uh, what team, or, you know, 49er score, you know, automatically display that to you, right? So this is all context awareness. And why do you use uh, context awareness? The purpose of context awareness is to let the device understand the user's uh, behavior and use that to do prediction and provide services, right? So that, that's a whole point about context awareness. And I think there's one problem with it uh, is that you have to put a lot of uh, different type of sensor, a lot of data processing to use circumstantial evidence and then use that to predict what's going on, what the user is going to do. 
And in a lot of cases, you are going to still do it wrong. Instead of looking at all those uh, contexts that a user is surrounding a user, uh, I think wouldn't it be a lot more direct that you can ask the user himself or sense the user directly? What is he actually thinking? What is his uh, desire, right? And I believe by combining the context and con uh, content, in this case, what the user is uh, thinking and feeling together, it will give you a, a lot more holistic awareness. And that's, uh, I think, is a key uh, to, to really uh, make wearable something that, that people will want to use. And another point here, okay, so the, the reason why I, 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 I talked about earlier, uh, biosensor is uh, something which can provide you this insight about what the user is actually feeling, what the user's uh, desire one is. And the other key point here is that biosensor is uh, naturally, uh, it needs to be close to human body and it get designed to wearable. And you think about the other way, is a wearable is an ideal platform for biosensor, not the smartphone. Okay, smartphone is okay for certain application for even for step count, people are now using the cell phone app to do step counts if you are carrying your, your uh, smartphone in your pocket, right? But it's not good for a lot of the biosensor application. So, Phone factor wise, if a wearable has a biosensor on it, it's not something that's easily gets sucked into what I call the vortex of the smartphone that's going to suck all those devices into it. That's great. Okay, so so uh, phone factor wise, you know that that's a, that's a one argument. But what's the killer app? You know why? would you want to wear a wearable? And we, we have a lot of discussion earlier about that. And uh, it's definitely a valid question. If there's no value proposition, there's no reason why a consumer is going to spend, you know, 50, 100, $200 to put something on their body, right? So uh, as I said, we've been in this uh, market for eight years and I've seen a lot of um, uh, different company design our sensor into different applications. So for the rest of uh, the talk, I'm going to share some general theme on uh, how they are using our sensor, not in the traditional way, but in the more in innovative uh, ways. Uh, the first area is in effective learning. Okay, And uh, one example is uh, when my son uh, takes a piano lesson, his uh, teacher would tell him, go home, practice one hour. He would go home, sit down, uh, turn on a, a stopwatch, do one hour, and then he's done. And leave to home, his own device, he will only practice things that he's kind of familiar with already and just keep playing. And that's not effective at all. By the time when he go back to the teacher, the teacher asks him to, to play the harder part, he hasn't practiced, and he's, uh, he's, uh, fro he's frozen, he's uh, nervous. From the learning uh, side, if you look at it, uh, when he's practicing at home, he's in the comfort zone, in, in, the, in the yellow area. When he's at the teacher, he's in the red zone, he's panicking. To be an effective learner, you need to be in the green zone. In the learning zone, things cannot be too simple, cannot be uh, too difficult. <clears throat> With wearable sensor today, there's uh, a lot of uh, electronic um, teaching material company that's working with us using our sensor to detect the learner's um, uh, uh, reaction to the different teaching material. Is it too, too hard? Is it too simple? And then adjust the delivery of those uh, teaching material. It can be actually a student, like in, in this uh, picture here. But, you know, think about it. You as a professional, every day at work, you are still learning new things. There's new challenges. And are you in the right state to be most effective at work? In, in learning. So this is something which can be applied beyond just student. It can be applied to everybody. And because as long as we are living, we should be continue to improve ourselves. A second example I want to talk about is in the area of uh, market research. This is more in terms of um, 
Thomas's. And, and this actually is the most, uh, I would say, most um, heated area of uh, the wearable side as far as the application goes. Um, people are trying to get into your transaction, you know, whether, as I mentioned earlier, understand you have your, your son's birthday and trying to advertise something to you or some other, uh, you know, um, marketing information and trying to get it in front of you. Uh, I want to use uh, actually a, a, a different example here in, instead of selling things. This is um, a program from the Discovery Channel where uh, it's called the Science of Sex Appeal. They have uh, uh, show pictures uh, to a group of women. And this is you know, a picture like, like what you see here. And ask them to rank uh, the person in 1 to 10 in terms of their sex appeal. And then they do the same with the second group of uh, women. The only difference is they include some additional information at the bottom, like in here. And suddenly, you know, a person that was uh, looking very sexy, very attractive before, once you see their income, their rating drop, right? So this is actually no different than, uh, you know, how people shop, you know. You, uh, we call it left brain and right brain. It's really, you know, um, not that, but you have your kind of the emotional side that really drive a lot of your decision. And then you use the logical side of your brain to override it or actually provide support uh, for your, your buying decision, right? So how do you, as a marketeer, you know, strike the right point uh, and understand where this consumer is in his uh, purchasing cycle? Is he at the point where he's uh, thinking with his left brain or in, in the, uh, in, with the right brain? How do you close the deal? Okay, so this is actually something that biosensor can help you determine and help in this uh, transaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, the, the third area, actually, I'm going to give you two examples, and uh, this is a, a workplace and productivity. And I think a lot of this is uh, driven also by uh, today, a lot of wearable uh, devices are being sold more directly into consumer. And as that can start kind of hitting some of the walls, uh, a lot of uh, the device manufacturers are actually looking at maybe we need to go into the professional world first and then uh, establish a good usage case from there and then go, go back to consumer side. So on the, on the workplace, and definitely, you know, you want to know how stressful a worker is. You don't want it to be uh, very unstressed uh, but at the same time, you don't want the worker to be too stressed. So uh, again, similar to learning, there's a, a good point in the stress curve you want your worker to be at, right? So we are, we, we are designed to this type of devices where we are put on the production floor and we are monitoring uh, the worker and, and compare that uh, against uh, their different assignment and uh, their schedule, their different shift. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, last example, still work, work, workplace uh, product, productivity. Uh, you probably know about Meyer script. And when I first uh, started my first job, HR people sent me down, had me write a, a questionnaire and then say I am, I am a four letter guy, right? And then, I, you know, people were supposed to interact with me based on my person, personality on how to negotiate, how to have effective meeting, and all that. And, and through the 30 year of working, I can tell you none of this four letter really map myself. And in fact, uh, every day when I go to work, based on my different uh, roles and positions, I would actually have a different type of behavior. So how do you actually help um, people um, Kind of dynamically recognizing you are in the meeting, what kind of people you are working with, what kind of way you can most effectively interact with them and get the, the best outcome you know, for everybody. So this is another area where there's a, a lot of work that's ongoing. Okay, so that kind of closes uh, my talk here. I talk about different application. Uh, you can use, the, the key here is, uh, you know, using those application 
using wearable devices that you can wear every day and then uses that to differentiate from uh, the other sensor that can be easily embedded into uh, the smartphone and smartwatches. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jake. That was really interesting. Appreciate that. Okay, I'd like to now introduce Tanuj Mohan, who is the CTO of Enlightened. And he has more than 20 years' experience in the computer networking and software industries, most recently at Tropos Networks. Uh, very interested to hear what he has to say about energy management, energy efficiency. It's a uh, very, very important uh, for, uh, for all of us as individuals and for the world. Welcome, uh, Manuj. Hey, thank you, Jane. It's been a long and dense day, so I'll try and keep it very light and superficial. <laughs> if anybody wants to get into any details, please ask questions, and that'll wake me up. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. So uh, it was, what, about five weeks ago, I was reading a very interesting report by Deutsche Bank. They talked about the state. They talked about the state of IoT, its potential, and what the major challenges are. Five years ago, we started Enlighted and faced those same challenges and literally solved each one step by step. So I'm going to start talking about IoT in its complete context, right from the end devices all the way up to applications in the cloud, and how we had to nail every level one at a time. How do I move the slide? Is there a clicker? Hit the right arrow. Hit the right oh, the arrow right there. Yeah, sorry. This one. Yeah. OK, so just to do a quick recap. Today we are in a hype cycle, and uh, IoT exists, but in silos. We, uh, it exists in silos, and uh, the true 20 to 50 billion units are expected in the next five to 10 years. It'll take a lot to get there. And uh, a lot of speakers have gone over the challenges that we face today. Hundreds of protocols. I loved it how Gene came out and said that none of them are going to cut it. And we will have to rely on multiple hodgepodge of, of protocols. I completely believe in what he said. Uh, the variety, the velocity, and volume of data is going to stress the network infrastructure as well as the data center infrastructure. We will need to do a lot. I mean, people are starting to figure out that if the data you know, is streaming at such a great volume, you cannot post-process it. Sometimes you have to do streaming processing. You have to do a lot of other things. So that's kind of where we are. A lack of a hardware platform, lack of a software platform is slowing it down. But at the end, people will put gateways, will put adapters, and make the whole thing work. So let me get into what our customers see when they see an enlightened solution. What they see is similar light fixtures like the one we have over here. Each one of them has a sensor attached to it. These sensors are multipurpose sensors. They have PIR motion sensors. They have ambient light sensors. They have temperature. And they can actually meter the light fixture. The sensors are autonomous. They have a brain. So if anything goes wrong, they can operate the light fixture on their own. If it's dark, the lights will come on if a person is present. If, if the cube's on the other side, there's nobody sitting over there, all the lights are full bright in our system, those lights would have dimmed. So as we are speaking, this room would be saving probably 25% of the energy, just because every fixture has its own sensor, is sensing its own environment, and autonomously in a distributed fashion responding. What we have today here is probably one occupancy sensor and two switches, whereas this entire area is a zone. So you can't do that granular occupancy saving. Each of these sensors have a wireless radio. They can talk to each other, do some kind of a coordinated behavior. We have a gateway that translates the wireless we have into a standard TCP IP network. We have an energy manager server that all the data gets collected into. This server has a lot of functions. It can send all the data out in the cloud or can integrate with other building systems. So in an I IoT play, what does this look like? We, we have IoT endpoints. Those are our sensors. We have an edge cloud, 
which comprises of our gateway and energy manager. We have a data center where all the data from all our various deployments get into. We have an open API and a whole slew of applications are being written on it. We kind of had to invent every layer. So I can start with the, with the bottom layer. We have intelligent sensors. So the sensors are capable of autonomous behavior. We picked 8215.4, and I can go through why we picked 8215.4. Because the chips were cheap. Wi-Fi chips were very expensive, and they required a lot more power and CPU to go with it. So we picked 8215.4. Then we looked at the protocol, and Zigbee was there, and I looked at the chip, and I said, the chip can do 2 megabits. Zigbee can only do 250 kilobits. I'm operating in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Why will I shoot myself in the foot? and consume eight times more airtime to send the same packet. It did not make sense to me. And then I looked at what Zigbee could do as an example. It could do probably 50 nodes per gateway. Today, I do over 1,000 nodes per gateway. Again, my background is 20 years in networking, so I mixed what we did. Some things are broadcast, some things are multicast, some things are unicast. The whole network adapts to the use case. The sensors are digital devices, and they are powered by the light fixture, so they don't have to sleep. So we put in as many sensors as we could. We put in the digital version of the sensor. So a typical occupancy sensor would give you motion, say, one or a zero over five minutes. We sample a digital version of the sensor 65 times a second and create signatures to figure out what's happening underneath it. So the amount of data we actually create per sensor in an hour is probably 10 megabytes. We ship. 10 kilobytes of it. The rest of it is used for locally optimizing what the light is doing. We created a ERC, which is our switch. It's a, it sits on the wall, so it's a battery-operated device. And that has different requirements, because now the device has to sleep. So our switches sleep all the time. You press a button, they wake up, send one message, and go back to sleep. Today, you might have a room this size, and the switch will turn all the lights off. You might partition this room into 10 different rooms. So the switch has to do something different. We don't configure anything on the switch. All the intelligence is in the sensor node. The switch simply wakes up and says, hey, somebody pressed my button and goes back to sleep. So we, we kind of had to figure out how to do a 10-year battery life device. Security was a huge challenge. You know, When you press this switch button, somebody can capture and replay. I'm not going to tell you what we did, but you can't in our in our situation. I mean, I looked at a lot of other switches that are piezoelectric and mechanical. They simply do not pass the security barrier. So many of these things, when you look at security, it's a pain. You have to be able to change keys. And if you can't change keys, you're compromised. So when we built our sensors, we started with security ground up. It's like a trusted platform module. And people ask me, are you crazy? What are you putting all these, you know, our CPU manufacturer gets a part of the code. Our flash manufacturer gets part of the code encrypted. And a part of the key goes to our contract manufacturer. And when he puts it all together, kind of like a TPM platform, the sensor comes alive. Otherwise, it does not come alive. And you know, I tried to explain this to the people in the lighting world. And they were saying, what? Then the target ha happened. And I said, huh, that can't happen with us. You know, Five years ago, I dreamed that this is the weak link. So we ended up solving a whole bunch of security issues over there. The edge cloud kind of gives us local compute. So if you want the HVAC system to react, it takes care of that. So if there are occupants in an area or areas, uh, there are people not there, it'll start dialing back the HVAC. It could do blind control. It does air quality. When we got into buildings, we were selling to the facility manager. So it was very difficult to to get IT in, you know, IT's blessings. So we went around them, we put 4G modems in, and we started shipping everything into the cloud outside of the IT infrastructure. The modems are very flaky. We were installed in, uh, you know, electrical closets in the middle of buildings. So the modems would go down, come up. You know, it was, it was, it was a kind of a variable bandwidth and latency. So from the edge cloud and below, we had to make sure that this was self-contained. It could do all its behaviors right there. When we get the data into the cloud, we get to know who, what, where, and when. So you have a complete portfolio-wide view. 
of what's happening. We have opened up our APIs and people are starting to build apps on top of it. I'll run through it. The first app we built is the Lighting Control app. The Lighting Control app saves about 65% of the energy in a commercial real estate environment. This actually enabled a way of getting an IoT platform in. So it's kind of the freemium model, if you will, but it gets paid for by energy savings. So we go to large customers now, we change the sale, we go to a CFO and say, hey, you pay $100 for your bill, tomorrow you pay 40 to PG&E, you pay us 40 and you see a $80 bill. And we go in and we have something called the Global Energy Optimization Program that we are starting to do to get mass deployments. So we had to kind of solve the business model of how do we get our platform because facilities are the lowest on the totem pole. You know, though we have a two to three year ROI, uh, they just don't get the budget. And what other money in, a in, a, in an enterprise is getting a 30, 40, 50% return? So there are other people in the finance world who are willing to finance that day in and day out. Uh, the HVAC Advisor app uses the same data and optimize the, optimizes the HVAC. We are getting a lot of interest in space utilization. So the other apps that we are building are a lot more powerful and valuable. You know, if one person can be fit in a 20,000 square foot office, more, that is equal to all the energy savings we could achieve in a year. The, we have found, you know, productivity increases, measured productivity increases. People have been working longer in many of the offices we are in because the sweep timer doesn't kick in at seven o'clock and signal them to go home. And just that, has an ROI of one week. Uh, I'll skip the apps, I will jump to the last one. So just like the internet changed everything, IoT will impact every facet of our lives. Just like the internet, proprietary working implementations of IoT will lead to the creation of appropriate standards for mass adoption. Thank you. That's really cool, that is really cool. All right. Um, we're going to skip the last panel since we only have 10 more minutes, or last speaker, but why don't, I'd like to actually, why don't uh, all of the speakers join, uh, join uh, me up here and have a seat. I do want to specially introduce my good friend Sarab Palin, who is uh, actually an expert in, uh, in, in, in advanced driver assistance systems, and why don't you grab a, grab a seat over there? And, uh, you know, he did have three serious automotive accidents in four <laughs> years, so he has a personal mission to uh, improve the safety of, uh, of driving. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually ask Sarab to just start out since he didn't get, uh, get a chance to give his presentation and uh, tell us a little bit about your view of, of uh, IoT, especially as it relates to cars. Uh, Thanks, uh, thanks, Gene. Uh, so it was a great introduction, as you all know now that I'm a bad driver. And that's always a good motivation. Like I wanted to improve myself, and I started looking at the problems that I was facing. Uh, and you would see a lot more like me on the Highway 101 as you are driving up and down, like people using the smartphone or you know fiddling around with stuff which they should not be doing while they are driving. So I noticed it was not just me, and there were people around me doing that too. So I thought it's like a bigger problem. And uh, the one of the first thing I wanted to do was get the phone out of my own hands. And one thing that kept me going was how do how do I still use my phone? Because there were a lot more things I was doing with my phone which was useful while driving, like using navigation or playing music, or just simply you know telling people that I'm going to be there in a few minutes or something like that. So the first thing that we did was we started building an application which allows us to use the smartphone while we are driving with a small piece of hardware which can be connected anywhere in your car. It could be a steering wheel or near your radio. It's a remote control which you can program and you can uh, select any four or five different apps you want to use with it. It also activates voice command and stuff like that. So uh, California also has a law, If I think most of them don't know, that you cannot even touch your phone while you're driving. Uh, people completely ignore that. Uh, but it's completely illegal to do that. And even if you're using navigation, you cannot hold your phone while you're driving. So uh, with our remote control, people were able to use their phone or people are able to uh, they, you know, uh, select any apps they want to use. And the next level of sophistication we wanted to add was uh, convert the phone, which is the biggest problem right now, especially on 101, on an average, there is a 10 to 12 accidents on a day uh, because of phones. 
uh, is like we converted uh, the phone itself into a driving assistance system where we have an application which allows you to mount your phone onto your, uh, onto your dashboard and it uses the phone camera to give you real-time feedback about your driving. So it converts your phone into a driving assistance system. Uh, we see a lot of new cars coming up with this technology, but on an average, the life of a car is 11 years and there are already millions of cars on the road. So this technology caters to that market right now and can be further uh, enhanced with adding more sensors and more uh, data connectivity through your phone. So, yeah. And I'd like to open it up to the audience. I think we'll, r we'll run it five minutes long, if that's okay with you. So we'll stop at 9.05, just to give uh, a little bit of time for uh, the most important and interesting part of the, the evening, which is your, your questions. So please, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yes. Uh, this is a question about the wearables. Uh, we talked mostly about wearing on our body. Uh, can you guys talk about uh, implantation possibilities? When you have the accident, it gets implanted in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So I, I personally believe that uh, going to come probably in a couple of generations. I think people, uh, uh, I'm talking about consumers, so, so definitely today for people who has a disability, they are probably willing to go through um, more drastic way of uh, getting sensor uh, on, on their body. But uh, typical consumer, I don't think so. But just like, you know, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, for me, I still grow up with a dial uh, telephone, right? But then uh, my, my son never seen it. And I think as uh, the, the generation move on, there might be a day when that's, that's uh, going to be a commonplace, but not today. Well, yeah, but I, I bet there's probably people who would uh, also complain that you are probably, you know, violating the pet's right when you implant something into the pet's right. <laughs> China, they tag their children. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, here's my wearable. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Jean, this is a question to you. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation on the application side. Thank you. But I was curious about the platform side. What was your business rationale? to go into the platform side, knowing that you have to build the ecosystem, you have to win over the developers, correct? And many platforms haven't made a lot of money. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, well, um, my, my last company uh, was called Bitphone. We made it into 300 million phones. And we would not have done that as kind of a focusing on the end user company. We actually do focus on the end user, as you saw, but what we're doing is we're trying to study what people really love for the purpose of bundling it up into service bundles and selling it to the partners who really will take this and scale it to millions or tens of millions and hundreds of millions and billions. Um, my experience is that small startups, and I've done five of them now, you know, we are the best at innovation and really coming up with those breakthroughs and really deeply understanding it to much more than the level of a PowerPoint, but really the day-to-day -day use. But still, it's very difficult to actually make it to 300 million or a billion, although it has been done. I just haven't done it. Um, the, the way to really scale, in my opinion, and, and I think this is a lesson for, for startups everywhere, is to not only understand those end user use cases, but then find partners who can really bring it to their customers and add, build a platform that is so valuable that they could not build it unless you know, they took five years or 10 years and then the market has passed. And so I personally think that this platform strategy of understanding the use cases but then packaging it up in a way that, for example, my last company, Bitphone, you know, we were, when we won China Mobile, we won 100 million customers right then. So that's, 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 how to, that's, that's my thinking behind how to scale a startup successfully. 
Yes. I had a question on the DSRC. What is the um, and uh, vision for uh, when it finally gets deployed in, in wide use? Is it uh, what is the latency first of all? And in terms of uh, is it intended to be a notification system or is there going to be automated automatic uh, response of all the vehicles? And what happens in that the probability of being able to prevent a, a given collision um, scales with the square of the uh, of the of the level of penetration. So we'll see a, a benefit curve that'll kind of go up as a square law. Um, now the the USDOT in particular is interested in accelerating the penetration through aftermarket devices. Um, like the kinds of things that Sara was mentioning. Um, we think there's potential for that. Probably they won't be quite as capable and quite as accurate as a, as a uh, device that's integrated in at the factory, but um, it'll help accelerate the benefit. Yes, sir. Oh, good. Yeah. So the uh, platform that, uh, Gene, your company has sounds quite interesting and uh, in the application that was demoed looked good. My question is, what experience do you have in terms of people's real interest in saving energy in their home? Because when you ask the question about who's looked at the energy usage, I was the only one raising my hand. <laughs> is that reflecting a reality in the marketplace? Do people really care about that? No, people do not care about energy. And that, that's why what we've had to... Let me, let me tell you a quick story. People power... You know, I had I had this last company was sold for 160 million dollars. I don't really have to work anymore, but I got really bored, and so I'm walking around my my kids' elementary school and reading about how their parents are destroying the planet. And I felt really guilty. I thought, ah, oh, I know we can fix this. And much to my horror, after a couple of years, it dawned on me: people don't really care about energy. <laughs> I'm going, oh my God, what do I do? So what we eventually did is, you know what? They don't care about energy, but everybody cares about something deeply. You know, They care about their family. They care about their relatives who may not be healthy. They care about their friends. They care about safety. They care about things like that. So what we've done, essentially, is we've been forced to, to not just concentrate on energy management because people don't care, we tie people what they really care about, and then we add energy management in as an additional benefit. So I want to know if somebody's breaking in my house, and I want to know if my kid doesn't walk through the back door by 3.30. Usually it's fine because he's just goofing off playing with his friends, but I still want to know. While I'm looking into that, gee, it's nice to know that I'm going to be over budget. And it's nice to know that I can turn stuff off automatically every night with just those rules that Song was showing. So we have tried, to, we have personally learned to align around what the, in the first session that the speaker said about you got to nail those use cases and you got to align with what people really care about. Otherwise, you're going to be building technology that people, in fact, don't really adopt in large scale. And so, you know, I think, I think that's, that's a very good point and a very good question. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody asked about the question about the implantables and everything. There are two types of implantables, mechanical and electromechanical and electronics. So unless you're not counting the pacemakers and the hearing aids, they're all implantables, by the way. So I just wanted to, you know, when you said it's going to take several decades, but actually it's been in practice for the last 20, 30 years. So I just want to chime in on it. Yes, uh, I do agree. And again, I think it's uh, when people has... Um, their whether disability, medical need, things like that, then people is willing to do that. And more talking about, you know, just everyday consumer, uh, the willingness to actually implant something. Um, I, I, by the way, it's it, it's uh, not a bad thing if a, a consumer is willing to to stretch and uh, accept it today. It's not a bad thing. But uh, you know, at least uh, so far, uh, even you know, for our sensor. We have to continue to stress to people our sensor. Uh, they are like uh, antenna; they only listen, 
they don't actually inject anything into your body. And you know, people do worry about it. They say, "Oh, you know, are you actually trying to control my mind?" But we say, "No, no, no. We are just listening only." Gene, you said that people don't care about energy, right? So, but do you does People Power or does the industry in general have any stats on when you tack on this energy any energy management? What are the best case and average case savings that people get? And yeah. are they really significant? Yes, I mean, maybe they, they are. don't care because they're not significant, or maybe they don't know. I don't know which one it is. Yes, no. So it's it is. It, I mean, you know, the fact is is that the average bill in the U.S. is about one hundred and five dollars a month. Now we we see it's pretty easy to say fifteen or twenty percent of that. So you know, it's it's a it's a it's a real savings. Not only that, but if you add it all up, it actually makes a difference to the planet. But the problem is, is that you know that's kind of like the price of two, you know, two Starbucks. So, so it and the the other problem is everybody is so busy, and so you know if if you're not in the top five of what they really care about, it's difficult to get the attention. But you know, people who adopt this, they really save money. They they should save more money than they they spend, which is always a good thing. Like like. Uh, uh, Tan, Tanu said, "You know, it's it's a it's a great deal. They can they can actually charge the customer and still save the end user a ton of money and be good for the planet. You know, if we just unplugged all of the TV. First of all, who in this room unplugs the TV from the wall every night? Raise your hand. Nobody. Nobody. Oh, you do. Okay, MP champion. I was in power management. He's in power management. Okay." Okay, you get five stars right there. If if everybody unplugged the TV every night, we would save the equivalent of two coal-fired power plants. But nobody's going to do that. So therefore, except for MP, because he's a, you know. So so you know that's why we're really looking to to make these things so engaging, so easy to set up and aligned with the, what they really care about, and then throw these additional benefits in. And that is going to be widely adopted. So it is now... Um, uh, Gene, uh, one more. Yes. One last question okay. and we're, we're last question. wrap up. Go ahead. It sounds like a lot of uh, people are going to use a lot of different Internet of Things devices. So the question is for all of you, but especially for People Connect, is are you trying to become a platform for people to use all their devices on your platform? Or are you trying to make it very easy for information platforms to be able to get all the data and control it? And do you just say, so every, would you? I guess all of them. Sir. Okay, why don't we, Saurabh, do you want to start, we'll just quickly go down there. So, uh, so to rephrase your question, you're trying to see if like, uh, is, uh, is everybody trying to be a platform or is everybody trying to control the data? Uh, is that the question? Like, It's essentially every one of you trying to create a platform where a consumer will go on your platform and then connect all the other devices to your platform? Or so, are you trying to make it very easy for other platforms to get all your data and control your devices on the different platform? So uh, I think most of us out here are trying to do a different set of data. Actually, we are all looking at different parts of data, whereas some of I'm looking at the driving data, uh, these guys are looking at some uh, home automation data. And depends upon which part you are monitoring. There is nothing existing right now in this space to have like a unified space that oh, this is how you're going to get the data out there. So the idea is to uh, you know create a platform which later on can be integrated with something else. But at this point of time, like uh, I think some companies like Mercedes and Nest are trying up recently. I've heard where uh, when you're driving home. Uh, your Nest knows that you're driving home in your car, in a Mercedes car, and it will turn on your thermostat or it will turn on your AC accordingly. So there is always, a, obviously, a play where all of these data will connect at some point. There will be a converging point, but currently there is no uh, existing platform. So everybody's trying to come up with their own way of getting the data and processing it. Yeah, no, I think I agree. At the end, uh, if we have to bring something to market, you might have to do the whole vertical. But each one of us knows where our strength is. So when the existing middle layers exist, we will move to it. And for us, it's our senses, uh, strength is in the sensors. And then in the rich data and the analytics, we do on it. Everything else in between, the hardware, the chips, the wireless protocol, that's just a tax. We had to do it with the best we have. If somebody else were to you know, give, give a solution from Qualcomm, 
that solves everything, we would just jump to it and not waste our time trying to reinvent the wheel. I think your question is probably more directed at these other folks, but I'll just say that from Toyota's point of view, you know, our platform is a car. Um, and of course, we are, we are aware that our customers are bringing devices into the car and we want to make it uh, useful. Uh, but also, of course, we're mindful of distraction and safety issues. So, um, so there's, a, there's a balance to be struck there for us. Yeah, for us, um, the, the platform to me actually is more um, on the software side. And uh, to us, um, it's actually more like a good engineering practice anyway. When you create a point solution, you actually create something that's more scalable in the future. So we, we do things like that, where we, we have things then we can later package, package up as a development kit or things like that that can be shared widely. But I share with uh, Jim's um, kind of concern that it's kind of difficult to, uh, to, to monetize it unless you have uh, the muscle to uh, get the industry or get the, get the whole e ecosystem established. So for us, it's more an opportunistic uh, uh, approach since we already did it, and then we'll, we'll see how well we can do it uh, by proliferating it through partners. So for people power, it's interesting. Um, our stuff is open source. <laughs> so you can go to GitHub and get all, this, get all the platform information you want. And so the idea is kind of both things that you're saying. Obviously, we need a critical mass of things that talk to each other before something useful can happen. So we make it as easy as possible to get those things on board. But if you choose our platform, we'll give you specific things that are pre-thought out, that all your work together to make sure it all works very well together. So I think, as everybody said here, we'll, if a huge platform becomes like the one, yeah, we can move. But one of the great things about building a platform is you can move very quickly, and other people can get on board very quickly. So I think it's important to make it very, very open. I'd like to thank the, uh, the, all of the speakers here, and I think this has been a, a wonderful, wonderful evening. I also really want to thank uh, Ty and I IEEE for hosting this this session, and let's uh, let's give our speakers a big round of applause.